blackmail is an ugly word. And when one of the blackmailer's victims sincerely insists that he's an angel, while another swears he's a devil, and still others are convinced he's a ghost, the problem of dealing with him becomes Herculean. My name is Robert Grand. I'm a 38-year-old bachelor. Music is my life and my love. And it was all I needed until now. Now I'm driven to tell this story, which happened exactly as I will describe it to you. It started on the day when I took over the management of the great Paris Opera House from the elderly and famous René Castelot. And last, Robert, but certainly not least, is this contract. A contract in a memorandum book? Why, René? Because that's the way the ghost wants it. <laughs> I, I never knew that the revered opera manager, René Castellot, had such a delightful sense of humor. Contract with a ghost? <laughs> Surely you're not serious. The opera ghost professes to be primarily concerned that the management give to every performance the splendor that belongs on what he calls the premier lyric stage of France. And of course this ghost will be the sole judge of the artistic splendor of a performance? Well, of course. However, there are two other conditions on which he places equal importance. Any attempt to perform an opera will meet with disaster if my allowance of 20,000 francs a month is more than 10 days late. Well, let me see. That monthly figure would amount to 240,000 francs a year. And this joker has further conditions? No, yes. Uh, if you'll allow me. Box five on the Grand Tier shall be placed at my disposal for every performance. Oh, surely you don't mean to tell me that you took these ridiculous demands seriously? I observed them scrupulously. You never defied him or threatened to have him arrested? How does one arrest a ghost? Well, when he comes to take his seat in Box five. He never occupied Box five. And you still kept it vacant? Certainly. Well, you won't find me wasting a box that way. I intend to sell it. Well, that's your privilege as the new manager. But if you will take my advice, you'll never sell Box 5. I didn't know whether to laugh at Castello's foolishness or to cry because such a brilliant impresario had obviously fallen victim to some hoax. However, more immediate problems were demanding my attention. My soprano sent word that she was too ill to appear that evening in the role of Marguerite in Faust. I replaced her with a young girl named Christine Donat, who to mine and everyone else's amazement gave a performance which brought down the house. Bravo! I thought you were in shock with your brother. I was until I heard that Christine was to sing tonight, and then I rushed to Paris. Forgive my rudeness. I <laughs> mean to congratulate you upon your appointment as the manager of the opera. Now I must congratulate you on choosing Christine. I uh -huh. never heard her sing like this before. Nor have I. What a triumph. Look at her. She seems quite overcome. Uh, overcome? Nothing. She, she's ill. She's, she's fainted. <laughs> led Paul Duran quickly backstage to Christine Donat's dressing room. A crowd had gathered outside her door. I made my way through with Paul by my side. I opened the door and saw that the house physician was by her side. To my surprise, Paul Duran walked swiftly to the couch on which Christine was lying and knelt down beside her. She turned her head, opened her eyes, and said, Monsieur, who are you? Mademoiselle, when we were little children playing together at Perrault, I was the little boy who went into the sea to rescue your scarf. Well, how amusing, monsieur. Mademoiselle, since it pleases you not to recognize me, I should like to say something to you in private. Something very important. When I'm better, please. And now I should very much like to be alone. I want all of you to go away. Please. <laughs> 
I wasn't aware that you knew Christine. Oh, I've known her for a long time, Robert. Ever since we were children. But we are no longer children, my friend. So why should we hang about outside her dressing room door like a pair of... And I know her well enough to understand that she asked to be alone because she wanted the chance to talk to me privately. <laughs> I didn't get that impression. But if you're convinced... Look, I'll prove it to you. Come on, let's go back and knock at her door, and you'll see. I don't know what you want of me. Oh, she seems to have someone in there with her. But that's impossible. We saw everyone leave when we did. Christine, you must love me. I do, I do. You know I sing only for you. Nevertheless, someone must have stayed behind. Maybe we can learn something. I do not listen at doors. I'm going in. No, no, no. Wait, wait. For my sake. Are you very tired? Tonight I gave you my soul and I am exhausted. Your soul is beautiful, child, and I thank you. The angels wept tonight. I must go home. Of course. They're sure to catch us each. No, 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 no. Come here. Quickly. They'll never see us in this corner. She's, she's, she's alone. There's no one with her. He must have remained in her dressing room. And she didn't lock her door. I'm going in and find out who was with her. Are you with me? Of course, Paul. Come on. But there's no light in here. He must be hiding. Strike a match, please. Hiding isn't going to help you. We know you're here. We heard you. Now come out. Can you see anyone? No. Well, he must be here somewhere. And we'll find him wherever he's hiding. You may as well come out now and, and save us trouble. I intend to find out who you are. There's no one here. And no place to hide. We're talking to the walls. <laughs> Robert, you know my family goes back to the days of Napoleon, and I'm sure you feel I lied to you when I said I knew Christine Donat. Certainly you had every What's right... What's about Donat? Well, this letter will prove to you that I wasn't lying. You see, she says right here, I have not forgotten the little boy who went into the sea to rescue my scarf. Then you know where she is. Of course. She is in Peru. And she is inviting me there, too, because it is the anniversary of her father's death. Uh, her father and I were friends. Do you mind if I go with you? How do you know I am going? Oh, don't talk nonsense. You're going because you're in love. And I'm going to bring back a singing sensation who hasn't been heard since the night of her triumph. So you came after all. I was thinking while I was at Mass... Will he come, and will he remember the end of the setting sun? You knew I would come, and you knew I would remember, Christine. Oh, I also brought Monsieur Grand. Well, how nice, but why did you... I am here to ask you to return to the opera, mademoiselle, and to ask you to sing other roles. Well, you will have to excuse me, Monsieur Grand, but I cannot talk of singing other roles now. But I have come all this way, mademoiselle, just to... I did not ask you to come. Or you either, Paul. You asked me to come, Christine. You knew your letter would bring me here to Perrault as surely as the sun shines. Well, that may have been a mistake on my part. There was no point in my remaining, as it was obvious that there was a lover's quarrel brewing. So I told Paul he could find me in my room. What you hear now is what Paul told me happened after I left them in the sitting room. Why do you say mistake, Christine? I don't know. When I wrote the letter, I was thinking of my childhood and my father and and the games we played as children. I, I think I wrote to you as the little girl I was then and, and not the woman I am now. When I came to you in your dressing room the other night, was that the first time you noticed me? No. I'd seen you in your box. I, I knew you were in the audience. Oh, good. Then why, when you saw me in the dressing room and I reminded you about the scarf, why did you pretend not to know me and laugh at me? <laughs> all right, all right. I know it was because there was someone in your dressing room, Christine. What are you talking about? The man to whom you said, I sing only for you tonight. I give you my soul and I am exhausted. You were listening at the door. That's the most... I listened, Christine, because I love you. Yes. 
Yes, I heard everything. All right, Paul. Tell me what else you heard. I heard him reply that your soul is beautiful, child, and I thank you. The angels wept tonight. Oh, Paul. You should not have heard that. You shouldn't. You shouldn't. And where is Christine now? Oh, I assume she went to her room. She ran from me, Robert. Why would she run from me? Oh, don't ask me to explain why women do the things they do. Why would she flee the opera after the triumph she had? There must be some explanation. There must be. Well, I can give you one you won't like. The voice we heard was the voice of Christine's lover. He didn't know about you, nor were you aware of his existence. She ran away to try to get things straightened out. That's why she wrote you. She knew you'd come here, and she'd be able to speak to you away from her lover. I won't believe it. Uh, don't forget, we checked, and there was no one in her dressing room. And don't forget, we both distinctly heard a man's voice. He had to be her lover. Or... Or someone who's been giving you problems, Monsieur Manager. Someone who calls himself the Opera Ghost. <laughs> At this point, I think I can say that I've become an authority on ghosts and their habits. Now, I've heard of ghosts who clank, ghosts who moan, ghosts who scream, wail, and even gnash their teeth. But this is the first time I've encountered a lovesick ghost who's also an opera lover. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. From time immemorial, out-of-the-way places have been favorite meeting spots for young lovers. And when a quarrel interrupts the course of true love, it's a common occurrence to find one of the unhappy pair sitting and waiting at their favorite trysting place, certain that the other must turn up. A cemetery, however, would seem a most unlikely place for a girl to expect to find her lover. Christine... I knew you'd come to pay your respects to my father at his grave, Paul. And I waited here to tell you something very serious. Paul, do you remember the Angel of Music? Oh, yes. Your father never told a story without mentioning him. I remember him saying that at least once in every great musician's life, the artist receives a visit from the angel. Yes. And sometimes, Paul... The angel leans over an infant's cradle, and that infant then has heard the angel, and the infant becomes a child prodigy. I remember. And when I asked Father if he had ever heard the angel of music himself, he, he shook his head sadly. But Paul, he told me that I would hear the angel one day. He said, when I'm in heaven, I shall send him to you. Paul... I have been visited by the angel of music. I don't doubt it. How is it that today you understand so well? You forget that I've heard you sing many times. And I never heard you sing the way you sang the other night. You were touched by genius. Yes. The angel of music. He comes every day to give me lessons in my dressing room. In your dressing room? The, the angel of music. What does he look like? You should know better than to ask that, Paul. I, I've never seen him. I only hear his voice. He speaks to me, and it, it's it, it's like in a dream. Are you sure you didn't dream all of this, Christine? How could I? I'm not the only one who heard the voice of the angel. Someone else has heard this voice? You, Paul. It was his voice you heard when you listened outside my dressing room door. Oh, Christine... You needn't have gone to such an elaborate lie to try to deceive me about the voice I heard. You think I lied? After all, I know what I heard. I'm beginning to understand. You think that that was a real man's voice. 
Well, if you had opened the door, you would have seen that there was no one in my dressing room. After you left, I did open the door, and there was no one there. And you still don't believe... I do not. Oh, how could I have ever loved you? Go away. I never want to see you again. The return trip to Paris wasn't pleasant. Paul Duren wanted so desperately to believe that his darling Christine was the victim of some cruel hoax. While I was convinced that Christine was an artful minx who was trying to keep two men on the string. This belief was strengthened by a telephone call I received the following day at my office. Grand speaking. Carlotta Sorelli. Oh, good day, madame. What can I do today for my beautiful prima donna? First, my dear Monsieur Grand, you must learn that I am not a woman easily intimidated. I'm sure you're not. But why do you call I me... I intend to sing the role of Marguerite in Faust Thursday night. Well, of course you do. Why would you call and tell me what has already been announced? Because of a note I received this morning. It reads, If you dare to appear as Marguerite next Thursday evening, be prepared for a gigantic misfortune. Oh, a prank. A jokester. Surely you're not going to take that seriously. That's exactly what I called to tell you. And I'm pleased you're taking it so well. Even if I were dying, I would sing the role of Marguerite next Thursday night. Before that Thursday night, I had to face the problem of the first masked ball to be held in the opera house under my direction. This was to be a truly gala affair, with everyone in fancy dress. I knew from experience that every artist would be there, hoping to meet and fascinate a masked member of the upper crust. I, of course, attended unmasked. <laughs> Oh, Robert! 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 Oh, Paul! Is that you behind this black domino? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I suppose you're seeking Christine, hoping to discover what masquerade she uses tonight. Huh? I don't have to hope. My Christine is behind that white domino over there, and we have a tryst in box 17 on the grand tier at midnight. Ah, and you're no longer concerned about that voice you heard in her dressing room? In her note making this assignation, she as much as admitted that you'd made a dreadful mistake about that voice. <laughs> I see. <laughs> Monsieur Director. What? What? When Sorelli fails to appear for Faust next Thursday, you'll replace her with the magnificent Christine. Who said that? It came from the white domino. Nonsense. Christine is wearing the white domino. Then Christine is using some trick to make sure she sings Marguerite again. Uh, there's where it came from. Uh, from the center of that crowd. Uh, the man in the scarlet cape and the death's head mask. You think so? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's almost positive. Come, let's unmask him. Read what it says on his cloak. Don't touch me, for I am the Red Death stalking abroad. You see, hold that man Stop in the it. scarlet Stop cloak. It. Quickly, after him. No, 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 don't touch him. He wears the mask of death. Who was that man? Why did you tell everyone not to touch him? Please, Paul, please keep your voice down. You shouldn't have come here. All right. All right, but you were the one who asked me to meet you here in this box on the Grand Tier, remember? I know, but that was before you started to chase the Red Death Mask. And why did you stop us? What is that masquerader to you? Maybe nothing, maybe everything. Oh, Paul, you were right. The voice I hear is not an angel, but a human voice. Belonging to... I don't know. I still haven't seen him. But what made you change your mind about the angel of music? Because he forbade me to see you. How did he know about me? I told him. The first time I saw you in your box, I rushed back to my dressing room. The voice immediately noticed that I was elated, and and, and when he asked me why, I, I saw no reason not to tell him about you. Yes, and? Well, the voice spoke to me with great sadness and said that if I were to give my heart on earth, there was nothing for the angel of music to do but go back to heaven and leave me. Leave me without any more lessons. And that was a thought I couldn't bear. I knew what the lessons had done for me in a few weeks' time. But how did the voice do this? What is the secret? Believe me, when I tell you I wondered myself, I, I even thought perhaps there might be witchcraft involved. Oh, ridiculous. You could never be caught up with the forces of evil. Well, then what is the voice? A man. Someone who... Yes. 
I confess, I am jealous. That's why I stopped. There is no angel of music, but there is a man. A man who must love you and, and want you as I want you. And I mean to find out who he is. No, no, you mustn't. That's why I had to see you tonight, to warn you. Promise me that you... I'll promise nothing. I am not afraid of this voice, even if you are. Paul, you must listen and, and try to hear how I discovered the voice was human. Listen, and if I have any power to transmit emotion, you will hear him as I heard him, and you will know why I'm frightened. You have lied to me, my child. Because you love Paul Durand. Why should my love for Paul distress you so? I have already told you. If you love him, then you do not believe in me. Believe in me, my child. Whoso believes in me shall live and sing. Whoso believeth in me shall also reach the heights. But I shall bring down those who oppose me. All of them. And don't think Eric cannot do that. Eric? That's your name, then. You're, you're not... Your angel of music? Most certainly, my child. I have proven that to you. I am your angel, Christine. But I warn you that I have an evil side. And I have power. How is it that Sorelli fell ill the other night? How does it happen that all the directors of the opera have taken orders from me? Who are you? And why did you choose me as a pupil? Because of your purity, child. And your beauty. Your gracious beauty. Where are you? Here. This is a, a childish game you're playing. Let me see. Never. The day you see my face will be doomsday for you, me, and everyone connected with the opera. And let me repeat my warning. If you want Paul Durand to live, you'll be very careful about seeing him. Who are you to give me orders? I rule here. The opera house is my kingdom. Kingdom. And all of you are my subjects. Dearest, did I succeed at all in recreating the power of that voice and the terror he inspired in me? Whoever or whatever he is, he, he must be completely mad. Perhaps, but nevertheless he does have power. What does it matter? You've told me that you love me and, and now all you have to do is leave the opera, marry me and we'll go away together. I cannot. I do not. <laughs> That's the most fantastic tale I've ever heard, Paul. And you believe it? Every word. Uh, it's obvious that someone doesn't want Sorelli to sing Marguerite tonight. This whole rigmarole of not seeing the voice. This nonsense I don't believe. Then what do you intend to do about that note? It was Sorelli's decision to ignore this second threat. And my decision to ignore the opera ghost. I ask you to join me tonight in Box 5 on the Grand Tier, where we will both enjoy a marvelous performance of Faust. The first act of Faust went very well, and as the curtain fell for the intermission, I allowed myself to relax in box five where I was sitting with Paul. Well, Paul, what do you say now? Do you still think we could have used the police? The police would have been useless, Monsieur Grand. Uh, did you say that, Paul? I didn't say a word. But you heard it. Tell me you heard it. Yes, I did hear it. Where is that voice coming from? Not from this box. We're alone in it. You are not alone. This is box five, my box. Show yourself, whoever you are. I must leave now because the house lights are dimming for the second act. And there will be a terrible calamity. Now listen, you... Raise your eyes to heaven and see and pray. The voice is coming from our left, two boxes down. No, 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 I thought it was on the right. Uh, the lights are dimming. The chandelier! 
Robert, look, Robert. Robert, we're swaying. It's going to fall right into the orchestra. Oh, no, 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 no. no. A natural accompaniment of any catastrophe is an attempt to discover the cause. And so it was with the collapse of the chandelier in the Paris Opera House. The newspapers speculated wildly as to the possible cause of the fall. But strangely, there was not one word printed about the opera ghost. I'll be back with Act Three shortly. No opera manager ever faced the problems that beset Robert Grand, newly appointed director of the Paris Opera House. How does one deal with some thing that no one has ever seen, but whose voice has been heard and whose presence has been accepted as a fact by opera workers and by your predecessor? A thing that called itself the opera ghost and who took credit for the catastrophic fall of the great chandelier which took the lives of three people and injured many more. Robert Grand made his decision. If I can have your attention, ladies and gentlemen, please, I will explain the reason I summoned you to my office. I have decided to make my peace with the opera ghost. This envelope on my desk will be placed in box five on the grand tier at tonight's performance. It contains the 20,000 francs which the ghost, or whatever he is, demands monthly. But I intend to reassign your locations so that box five will not be unwatched by less than three pairs of eyes for one single second. And I insist on an immediate report to me when and if you see anyone entering or leaving Box 5. Robert Grand. Where have you been, Robert? I've called your home, your club, even the Café de l'Opéra, and I could not reach you. Is there something important? <laughs> your ghost bleeds, Robert. <laughs> your opera ghost bleeds. Real blood. Are you drunk? Or just raving. And if he bleeds, as I know he does, then he's no ghost at all, but real flesh and blood. Isn't that so, Robert? What are you talking about? What makes you so certain that he bleeds? Because I've shot him. Yes. Come to my apartment. I'll show you the blood stain. Uh, Robert, you're here. And now I will free you from your ghost forever. I've already called the police. Here, come. Let me show you the balcony. I don't want to see anything until you calm down and explain what happened. His eyes. You have to see those eyes to understand, Robert. You have to see them. Are you trying to tell me the ghost was here? Exactly. And I know how to get him here. I played on his weakness, Robert. His human weakness. His love for Christine. I told you that, but you wouldn't listen. I can't make head or tail out of what you're trying to tell me. Now, I'm willing to listen, but only if you calm down. All right. All right, Robert. Everything I suspected is true. Now, I'll try to give you an exact picture of what happened. It started when I saw Christine yesterday. Where? At her mother's. Mm. She didn't go to the opera. I went to tell her mother that I wanted to marry her and take her away. Now, what did Christine think about this? Yes, she was frightened, terrified by this this man posing as a ghost. Well, I, I left after telling her I would expose him. And I came home here and it was very late and prepared to go to bed. Uh, come, let me show you. Uh, let, let, let me show you my bedroom. Oh, I'll admit, I'll admit that my mind was filled with wild thoughts that night. Well, I turned out the light and as I climbed into bed, suddenly, at the foot of my bed, I saw two eyes, red and glowing like coals, just the eyes. I switched on the light, leapt out of bed. The room was empty, but I saw a shadow on the balcony. I ran to the bureau, opened the drawer, and took out this revolver, and I fired twice. You see? Look, here. There are two empty chambers in my gun. Huh? Now, come, come to the balcony, and I'll show you 
I'll show you the blood. Where the door's open? Yes, yes, of course. Here. Here. Now, look. Is that blood? Yes. Yes, it is blood. Yes, of course. Now, a ghost who bleeds can be found. A wounded ghost can be traced, huh? Huh? Well? I see the blood. I also see a cat. No, there was no cat. Not on the balcony, but limping along the roof, trying to find a gutter to climb down. Oh, my dear Paul, I don't know about the eyes you think you saw glaring at you. But I'm afraid you've shot a cat. The next 48 hours will live forever in my memory. I expected that the envelope containing the 20,000 francs which I had left in the well-guarded box five would somehow disappear. It did. But as I also feared, all three persons assigned to watch the box swore no one had entered or left the box. Far more disturbing was an unannounced visit from a dangerously quiet Paul Duren on the following day. Robert, I need your help. Of course, Paul, I'll do anything in my power. But uh, don't you think that you'd better see a physician? Christine Dona will be appearing tonight in Faust. Yes, but not in the leading role. I've decided... No, that's not important. I think you should know, Robert, that she's agreed to go away with me. My carriage and coachman will be at the stage door promptly at 11. What I need from you is a way that she can slip out unobserved. Well, the whole backstage is honeycombed with trap doors, but I don't know any that would lead out of the opera house itself. Perhaps René Castello might. He was the manager for 17 years before he retired. I'd appreciate it if you check with him and... And also one other favor. I don't want to be seen myself. I wonder if you'd be kind enough to let me use your office tonight while the performance is in progress? Certainly. But isn't this flight a sudden decision? It's the only way. I've spoken with Christine, and she agrees that our only hope lies in getting out of Paris, even out of France. Mm, that may be wisest. But why leave from here? Christine absolutely refuses to give up tonight's performance. Not only does she feel obligated to you, but she also believes that Eric would somehow find out that she wasn't going to appear. Oh, yes, she may have a point. The opera ghost, or Eric, as you call him, seems to know more about what goes on than I do. We'll meet back here in my office at 8 sharp. May I thank you, Monsieur Castelot, for taking the trouble to come here to tell me about the special exit. Uh, it hasn't been used in years, but but I think the door still works. What time is it? Oh, relax. It's only 9.40. Plenty of time. She's disappeared. What? What's happening? Oh, I'd better get out and see what's happening. I'll be right back. By God, there must have been another accident. Uh, from my experience, it sounds like something's happened on stage. Oh, oh. I have terrible news, Paul. Christine has disappeared. Oh, no, that's impossible. That was the reason for the commotion. In the middle of a scene, she seemed to be lifted straight up into the air and then disappeared as the lights went out. <laughs> Christine, oh. my love, oh. please tell me you're not hurt. Oh. Well, who are you? And why are you, why are you mad? Oh. I'm sorry that I was so clumsy and made you strike your head when I... Eric, Eric, what have you done? Only what you made me do, Christine. I told you that if you'd continue to see Paul Durand, things would end badly. Where am I? In my house. It's my dearest wish that you'll grow to like it. You intend to keep me here? I cannot allow you to run off with Paul Durand as you planned. But they will look for me. And they will not find you. <gasps> Have they ever found me? <laughs> Why do you cry? You know it pains me to see you cry. <laughs> I would never keep you here against your will, but I warn you, if you leave, 
You sign Paul Duran's death you, warrant. You're afraid even to let me look at your face. Careful, Christine. But I shall... I will tear that mask off. Uh, <laughs> you're in no danger, Christine. I will not hurt you. So long as you do not touch the mask. And you expect me to believe that? You have no better friend in the world than myself. It took all the strength that both I and René Castello possessed to hold Paul Duren in his chair in my office after he learned of Christine's disappearance. This would never have happened if I hadn't asked her to come away with me. I, I'm convinced she's still in the opera house. I've seen the thing, uh, whatever it is that calls itself the opera ghost. Where? When? Why didn't you tell us before? I, I, I tried to warn well, you. Well, never mind that. Where is he and where is Christine? Well... I can tell you what I suspect. About a year ago, I worked late, and I decided to go backstage. There was only a work light, and as I stumbled around in the dark, I suddenly felt myself falling, and I landed in, well, in, in some sort of tunnel under the stage. Someone caught my arm and broke my fall, and a voice said, Careful. I looked around, and... So only two fiery red eyes glaring at me out of the mask. The same eyes I saw. Although I was afraid, I, I asked the apparition his name. And he laughed and said, I am Eric, and you've invaded my domain. But since it was an accident, there will be no punishment this time. But, Mr. Manager, I warn you... Eric's secrets must remain Eric's secrets. Whatever that may have meant. Well, after the meeting, I was convinced that Eric, or the opera ghost, lived or haunted the subterranean cellars and caverns beneath the opera. Incredible. I investigated all the trapdoors, looking for the one through which I'd fallen. And one day, I found it. I'll show you where it is. And... Here is the key to Eric's house, where I believe you'll find Christine Donna. Wait. I see something. It's the door. Robert, we found it. We found his house. Uh, What's the matter? I just remembered what René said about the key and opening the door. Well, you can do as you like, but I am going in. What's the matter? I, I, I don't know. It's, it's tricky. Maybe it's the wrong key. No, no, it fits. But but the tumblers seem to be stuck. Oh, is that you? Yes, yes, Christine, it's me. I, I must be dreaming. No, it's no dream. Can you help me open the door? He's tied me up. Damn him. Uh, uh, oh, Christine, oh, my darling, what has he done to you? I'm all right. But untie me quickly. Yes. We must get out of here before he comes back. Where are we going? As high up as we can get. Faster, Paul, faster. Shouldn't we have tried to get out? We don't have time. He's due back at 11. We're trapped. No. No, push this door. It opens onto the roof. Uh, 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 the, the sky. The blessed sky. And the stars. It is only up there on the stars that you can escape me. Eric! Show your face, you coward. Where are you? Look for me. Behind all the smokestacks, but you won't find me. You're a coward. You're a liar. You think so? Then I show myself. Here. Here I am. At last. Here. I raise my mask a little. Only a little, but you can see my lips. Such lips as I have. And let you hear my voice. You are a coward. Show your full face. My face. You shall see my face. And then you shall die. No. No, Eric, I beg you. My face that even the mother who bore me wouldn't bear to look at. Here. Ah. Now. Look at my face. Ah. Good Lord in heaven. You wanted to see it. You wanted to see a face without a nose. With dead eyes. 
and the lips of a corpse. Now look as I come closer. The horror that is my face will drive you over the edge. Oh, my poor Eric. My poor, poor Eric. Christine, <laughs> you are crying. You are weeping. And for me, a woman, a beautiful woman, weeps for me. If it were tears you wanted, you could have showed your face. And the world would have worked for you. I set you uh, free. And in freeing you, uh, I free myself. Uh, Here, I leave you my mask. Eric! Eric, don't show me! I love you, Christine, uh, as no other man could ever have loved you! Uh, 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 Even today, there are those people who say that the Phantom of the Opera was a ghost. That the story of Eric was manufactured to appease a frightened public. There are others who say it never happened. And perhaps it didn't. But to those who say it never happened, I say, perhaps not. But it could have. I'll be back shortly. In looking back over the story of the opera Ghost, I think I've made a discovery of some importance. If you recall, Eric, or the Ghost, wrote threatening letters to the manager of the opera house when he felt slighted. He also wrote contracts in red ink in a memorandum book. Now, if he really were a ghost, and he did write these documents, could we say that he was the first ghost? writer? Our cast included Gordon Gould, Court Benson, Carol Titel, and Paul Hecht. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.